Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Renewable Energy Day today with Engineering Tomorrow. We are so fortunate today because we have the amazing Dr. Eric Einstein, who actually developed this lab here to lead this lab for the entire day. So you guys are in for a treat. I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. Please make sure that you rename yourselves with your school name and your school location so we can know that who you are and who's with us today. If you have the ability to, please turn on your cameras. Additionally, we love student engagement. Do not, I know that sometimes in this setup, there's a lot of, I see a gym, I see you, the students don't have access to chat, but your teachers are free to unmute or type in chat and let us know if you have any questions or comments. And I'm gonna stop speaking because I'm not the star of the show today. Today we have, again, Dr. Eric Einstein, who's going to be leading, and I'm gonna let him take it away for your intro to renewable energy. All right, thanks, Monica. Uh, everybody hear me okay? I think it sounds like it, that you can. Um, so anyway, thanks everybody for, for uh, joining today. This is actually, I believe this is the largest event we've ever done in Engineering Tomorrow so far. And um, so it's, it's a very exciting for us. And I hope you're, you're interested. It sounds like I would assume you'd be interested in learning more about renewable energy since you're signed up for this. I mean, it is a big topic these days. Um, it's something that's kind of changing the world. Um, you know, I'm sure you've heard and you, you hear a lot about climate change and, and all the, the challenges that we have with, with more severe weather and everything. And um, just honestly, you know, there's, there's a limit to, to how much fossil fuels are available, but renewable energy has just been booming lately. And what we want to do is, is show you how engineers are involved in developing renewable energy um, for for uh, creating sustainable uh, power for people uh, and for businesses and for industries and for the world. And um, hopefully you'll go away really understanding more about how how it all works. And, and you'll find that it's a, it's a very interesting field with a lot of opportunities for jobs, um, for engineers to solve problems in renewable energy. So let me start by sharing my screen and um, making sure that hopefully you can hear the sound when we do some videos here. So hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so anyway, yeah, we're gonna talk about renewable energy, which the, first of all, we think mainly about wind and solar, and that's what we're gonna focus on today. Um, but there are other types of renewable energy. There's wave energy, and there's, uh, there's different things that where you can, you can basically um, have free fuel, if you will, uh, and create electricity out of it. But we're gonna focus on wind and solar. And if you know a thing about engineering tomorrow, um, you'll know that you know these labs, these uh, these um, activities that we we have are all designed by engineers. So I actually was um, uh, the, the lead on developing this lab. It, it turns out we used to have two labs, as a wind lab and a solar lab, but we put them together. And then we also have um, engineering students that work on helping us do this uh, as interns. So Anna and Jackie worked with me last summer. To put these together, um, and you can see what our kind of what our background is. But just to, to give you a little bit more background about me and my my career, um, I've been working for um, over thirty years now. I worked for a company called GE, which hopefully you've heard of, um, for for quite a seventeen years. Uh, my background was a, was a chemical engineer, so I I did chemical engineering uh, at Cornell and then the University of Minnesota. And you may wonder how does chemical engineering fit in with, um, you know, with renewable energy? And there's not really necessarily a direct link, but I think it's a good example of how even as a, 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 of an engineer, a trained engineer in college, uh, as, as in one field of engineering, you learn a lot of basic skills in engineering and problem solving and to think about how processes work and about technology. And, you know, throughout your career, you can, you can do a lot of different things as a result of that. So for the last probably five years, I've been working for a company that um, invests in renewable energy um, assets, essentially power plants, wind plants, uh, wind farms, um, solar farms. So here are, here are some pictures that I, of me and that I've also taken um, of some of the late things I've been working on lately. Uh, one, one of the things that we have invested in quite a bit is offshore wind, and you can see the picture on the um, on the far right here is is the, the view from the top of a of a offshore wind turbine looking out over uh, a wind farm, which is in the North Sea. 
Um, here's another view from basically getting up right behind the blades. Uh, obviously, the blades are stopped, and you can look out and you can see see how many wind turbines are out there. Here's a picture of me. Um, you have to go through a lot of um, safety training and and kind of preparation to be allowed to go offshore. And uh, so this is a lot of the harnessing that we have to wear, which we have to be trained in and the safety. Um, these other pictures here in the middle, this one is actually from a, a solar farm that, that one of our companies uh, was building um, in, in Japan. So we also have uh, um, businesses in Japan where we, we build renewable assets. And here you can see uh, this is in process. They, there's a lot of design that has to be done in terms of uh, the construction of these solar farms. You know, here's the, the mounts and, and uh, then they, they, they mount the solar panels on them. This is a fixed fixed system so the solar panels don't move but there's also systems out there where the, uh, the solar panels will follow the sun so anyway but this is a little about my background i've um i've, eric, I've been working eric, i'm yeah. sorry i don't know if you have access to the chat but we already have a question from curtis high school and okay. they, i know you're probably going to get to this in the wrap-up but they're here right now live and they want to know what type of income would would they expect in your field <laughs> <laughs> of course of, of course, course you want to know that <laughs> So engineers, um, basically engineering, engineers are, are well trained in college because and they add a lot of value. So they get they really do get good, good pay. So as a starting engineer, you'll probably be getting up, you know, in the uh, 60, 70, 80 thousand dollar range per year. Um, after several years, once you become more established, you'll be in the, say, 120, 130, 150 thousand or more, depending on what type of role you have. Um, so again, uh, and this is true for, I think for anything, the more you value you can add to your businesses, the more people will want to hire you and pay you. So, but, but um, the engineering can be a very good, very good uh, and lucrative career. Uh, we will give you some numbers in the wrap up. So they'll be more specific there. So anyway, hopefully that answers your question. So, um, what kind of engineers work in the renewable energy? And this kind of comes out of this question. And there's different types of engineers. Um, and you can see, uh, you can go in the electrical control route. You can be more mechanical civil, if you look more like structures. Um, you can do aerodynamics, which is, again, part of mechanical engineering. Uh, materials engineers are developing new materials to try to find better ways and better materials to build things out of. But there's all kinds of different engineering that goes into renewable energy. So if you have an interest in this area in general, um, you know you can get into it with a, in a lot of different ways in, in different types of engineering. So what we're going to do today, though, is we're going to um, talk about how the sun and how this wind uh, energy can be captured and converted. And what you're going to do is you're going to be building a hybrid wind solar structure, and we want you to basically build a little house um, and you're going to have uh, LEDs to light up. So we can use, you can use renewable energy to, to light up your house. So let's start with some of the basics. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the difference between power and energy. Uh, if you've taken physics or if you're going to be taking physics, you will come across uh, some of these definitions. So power is basically kind of an instantaneous measure of something. It's, it's how fast you're you're doing work. So I like to think about um, if you're if you're a runner or if you're biking um, and you're going on a flat flat uh, area. Once you hit a hill, you need to apply more power to get up that hill at the same speed. So that's power is usually measured in watts, um, and there you know in physics you'll learn more about other ways of describing power. Now that's different from energy. Energy is essentially how long you can apply power. Um, so if you're if you're doing a sprint, you want to have a lot of power because you want to run really fast for a short period of time. If you're doing a marathon, you need to have a lot of energy because you're going to be running and you're going to be running for a long period of time. And energy is essentially just the amount of power that you're applying over a given time. So it's power times time. Um, and energy, as a result, we're going to talk about uh, it's usually referred to in units of watt hours, which is just like that power times time, a watt hour of energy or a watt of power. So on the bottom, you'll see uh, kind of the old traditional light bulb was a, a hot filament and a typical light bulb was maybe 60 watts. It took that much power to actually light up. 
Now, light bulbs and lighting is now shifting towards LEDs, a light emitting diodes, which are much more efficient. And uh, the similar amount of light can come out of a, a, an LED light bulb for only seven watts. So about one tenth of the amount of power that's needed. So as you can imagine, over time, if you're running those light bulbs for five hours, it, the, the LED light bulb uses a lot less energy. Now, the refrigerator in the middle, um, that's a little bit more of a complicated system. It has a compressor and it, that when that compressor is running, cooling your refrigerator, it may be running and may be consuming 500 watts. But the thing is that turns on and that turns off. When the, when the temperature in the refrigerator is cold enough, it turns off. And then as the temperature gets warmer, you turn it on again. So it's more, we talk more about how much energy in a year would you use. So just as an example for the typical refrigerator, it could be four kilowatt hours or 4,000 watt hours per year. Now we're gonna be talking about the energy and the power in the sun and in the wind. So on a summer day, when the sun is at its peak, um, the sun is shining, you can feel it on your hands, it feels warm, you might get sunburned or suntanned. Um, there's energy in coming, coming from the sun. And the amount of energy is on the order of about a thousand watts for every square meter of, of the earth. So that's about one kilowatt per square meter. And we're gonna use that number later. In, for wind, there's also power, there's also energy. So if you have a good strong wind, which is run, blowing at about 20 miles per hour, that's getting closer to about 2000 watts per square meter or actually 1750 watts per square meter. So again, it's per area because the more area you have, the more you can capture. But that gives you an idea of how power and energy is talked about and, and how we, we, we kind of describe it. It's their fundamental concepts in renewable energy. So let's look at how now how wind power works. So essentially a wind turbine is uh, shown here. There's a number of wind turbines and there's some basic pieces to it. First of all, let's start with the blades. The blades obviously are the things that capture the wind. Um, they're attached to a rotor and the next page I'll show you more. Uh, so there's a blade and rotor uh, assembly. They are attached to what's called in the cell, which is this little box up here which is essentially where a lot of the equipment sits. And then that is all sitting on top of a tower. You wanna to have a high tower because the wind is usually stronger up high above the, above the ground. And the, the scale of these things is huge. Uh, some of the newest wind turbines offshore, the blades are 80 meters long, which is getting close to the length of a, of a football field. Um, the tower, is is extremely tall, I mean, obviously as, as high as they can get it. And you can see the scale of this right here. There's That's actually a little person right there. Um, but these turbines are very you know, efficient or they're meant to be efficient capturers of wind and they convert the wind energy into electrical energy. And each turbine can power you know, a thousand homes or more. So if we, if we talk about the fundamentals of conversion of energy, we have, picture here, the kinetic energy of the wind is, is blowing and it's turning the blades. So you can imagine you need to have some good aerodynamics to make sure that the blades are capturing that energy and turning. That Those turning blades are turning this rotor, the shaft. Um, quite often that is going into a gearbox, which changes the gearing of the, um, of the, the, the rotation so that you get a higher gearing coming out. And that higher gearing is going into a generator. And the generator is kind of the, the key uh, piece of equipment that converts rotational energy into electrical energy. Uh, and then finally, that electrical energy is sent down the tower in, uh, with cables. And then from tower to tower, those electric cables are connected to a substation, and then it goes to the power grid. So that's the basics of how wind power works. Now. As an engineer, you know you you do a lot of you know math. You do a lot of thinking and modeling of things with with math. And if you wanna if you wanna get a sense of how much power can I get from wind for a given turbine, here's oops sorry here's a basic equation that that kind of converts that. So the power that you can capture is going to be a function of the density of the air. So 
you know, the density of the air varies. When it's cold, it's more dense. When it's hot, it's less dense. Uh, so as a result, in cold weather, you'll tend to get more power out of your wind turbine. It's also a function of the wind speed. Uh, and that's actually the wind speed to the cubed power. So that's why higher wind speed, as you can imagine, is can capture more wind, more power. And it captures it. It goes up very quickly uh, since we're to the third power here. The CP factor here is just a power coefficient, which is kind of a conversion coefficient. And then the area here is the area of what that is swept by these blades. So the, the area is shown down here. So the longer your blades, the longer the radius, the, the, the greater the area that you can capture wind. So this is one of the reasons why over time, wind turbines have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger because they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger area. They can capture more wind. And uh, and they can generate more power. So I won't go through it here because I want to make sure we get through all of the content and you get a chance to to to, to actually do the the building. But essentially, you can do some math to figure out that if you have wind turbine blades that are half a meter long, and it's about what half a half a yardstick long, you can go through the math and you can find out that the amount of power that you could get out of that is about 140 watts. Um, and remember that light bulb, that original light bulb we had, 60 watt light bulb, um, There's you can you can power a couple of those, two or three of those, um, actually two of them. Um, but if, if you have those those seven watt LED light bulbs, you can power a lot more of them. So so this is this is how the wind um, wind is is captured and how you can do the math between wind and um, the the electrical energy. So one question would be, okay, knowing that, now you understand how the engineering design works around a wind turbine and what are the factors that matter. Um, where do you think wind turbines should be placed? You know, how do you think, what do you think people uh, make their decisions on where to build a wind farm? So here's here are a couple of wind farms. Uh, here's one called the Borkum Rifgrim II, which is off the, uh, off the German coast in the North Sea. Uh, over here is one called Alta Wind Farm. This is in uh, in a place called Tehachapi, California, uh, near the Mojave Desert. And then here's just a nice picture I found, which has a bunch of wind turbines up on a ridge. Um, so what do you think are some of the key factors in going into where we decide where to build a wind farm? Uh, so maybe you can put some ideas in your chat. What do you think is... is, is uh, is uh, you know the main main factors that they just use to decide where to build a wind farm? Altitude, maybe. How strong the wind is? Yeah, open space, height, wind consistency, available wind. Yeah, you guys are getting it. Obviously, the number one factor is wind. You need to have wind. Um, the altitude, that's actually an interesting uh, answer because quite, you think of that as being up on high in mountains. And it's not necessarily the altitude, but the fact that the wind is strong up there that may, that's, that matters. Empty areas, um, it's a good point. I mean, a lot of people, you need to have some space. You need to have land in order to build these places. Um, easy to reach, uh, that obtainable, that's a good point. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. You actually have to build these things. So you have to be able to get these big structures to remote areas if it's, if, if, and if you can see that it could be tricky there's no road up here, so they have to build a road in order to actually assemble these turbines. So these are all great answers. Um, and then not far away from society, that was the last one I was going to point out. This is power that needs to be used by people. So you usually want to have it near cities uh, or near population centers. So let me show you a video. This is uh, basically a, a video of a land-based turbine, and I want to show you what goes into actually building these turbines. Pretty spectacular. Mundo makes Gans great again. Yeah, you know what? I'm not gonna say again. Uh, uh, shoot. I'm not getting the uh, I'm not getting the video. So tell you what, let me. I don't want to waste a lot of time showing this video. Uh, but see, needless to say, uh, there's you, you need to have big cranes. You need to have um, uh, very large construction equipment. 
Um, you have to you have to find uh, places where you can put foundations. Uh, you have to be able to lift these nacelles up very high onto onto the top of a of a of a tower. Um, and there's a lot that goes into assembling these wind turbines uh, on land. And let me I just want to show you a little bit about what it what it is that uh, how they do these assemblies offshore. So this is a couple, these are a couple of pictures of the assembly of a wind turbine offshore. Um, so the offshore wind, first of all, they need to have a foundation. So one of the types of foundations they use are called monopiles, which are basically big, huge steel tubes, which they pound into the ocean bed, into the ocean floor. Um, so these are these these are monopiles. These these steel tubes can be as big as seven or eight meters in diameter, and maybe eighty meters or more tall, depending on how deep your water is. So what they'll do is they'll place them in the seabed, and then they'll have essentially a hammer, and that's what this is doing here. This is essentially a boat which is sitting up on four legs on the ocean floor. And it has a big heavy hammer that's pounding that monopile into the ocean bed. And then once that has been installed, the um, the the, mon the next next step is to you know assemble the the turbine itself. And here's another vessel again sitting up on four legs, so it's sitting above the water, and it has a big huge crane. And that crane then has assembled this tower. It has then put the nacelle on top. And then it is put on and assembled these these uh, four or these three uh, uh, blades onto it. So so even offshore, one of the advantages of offshore wind is that there's more space. As long as your equipment is uh, you know near the near the coast, um, you can put it on very large boats and you can assemble these things uh, a lot easier or at least with more space than than onshore. So that's how wind wind works. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, give you a chance to, to build your own wind turbine and um, and um, uh, light up an LED with it. But but first, we're going to talk a little bit about how solar solar power works. Um, I know that there's a lot of questions in, in the chat. What I'd like to do is when you guys are starting to work, um, I'll see if I, I'll try to, to get back to some of those and, and we can maybe answer some of them a little bit later. So for solar power fundamentals, Solar energy uh, is, a, is a huge potential. This, this uh, chart just shows kind of the size of the, um, the amount of sun that is available every year or the solar energy that is available every year that hits the, the earth. And it compares it to kind of the amount of wind energy. You can see it's a much smaller bit, but still a very, very large amount. This circle gives you this, the size of the consumption of energy in the world. And then on this side shows you the various reserves that we have of natural gas and oil and coal and uranium um, uh, in a basically total total reserve. So these would be consumed. Um, and once they're gone, they're gone. While this is all every year we get re uh, renewable use of all this, this energy. So solar energy obviously is, is a huge potential and huge opportunity. And it really is is uh, something that we want to capture because it's free energy and it's um, it's like I said, it's renewable. So there's two types of, of ways to take solar energy um, and to convert it into electrical energy. So there's two basic designs. Let me start on the left here or on the right. Um, one is called a solar thermal plant where you essentially have mirrors. You can see these are curved. These are curved mirrors that reflect the sun's energy. And it reflects it to this tube, which is running down the middle here. Uh, and that tube has oil in it. So what you're doing is you've got this massive mirror heating up the oil to a very high temperature. And then that oil can be circulated into a boiler, which makes steam out of water. And then that steam can be used to run a turbine to make power. So that's one way of of uh, capturing the solar, uh, the energy from sun. A more common way now, uh, since over time we've much more readily available, um, uh, we've now got manufacturing for these solar photovoltaic cells. So solar photovoltaic plants or PV plants work in a different way. 
they're not using the heat from the sun to heat an oil. They're actually taking solar energy and the photons from the sun and directly converting them into electrical energy. And so this is the one, this is the type that you're going to be, be working with today. So um, again, I'm going to, I'm going to talk through this uh, instead of showing this, this video, just because I have a feeling the video might not work well. Um, so the way a photovoltaic cell works is it takes the, the photons from the sun um, and it's, this is a very specially designed material. And it's a material that is, again, it's an engineered material. Um, it Typically it's out of, made out of silicon, but they use also other types of semiconductors. And what they do is they, they do a process called doping of the silicon or the, the semiconductor. And doping basically means they add a very small amount of a particular uh, element in the manufacturing of this, this crystal. And that very small uh, quantity of the other element, the, the doped material, um, provides for extra electrons or extra holes. And basically, uh, if you get into if you get into uh, semiconductor materials, uh, it's a it's a it's a wild field of physics where you talk about the movement of holes and movement of electrons. Um, but what happens is that this these photons will then uh, kick off an electron from the, the dope materials. And then it'll make that electron free to flow. Uh, and that electron wants to flow to this other side of the, the, of the, the, the device, but there's a barrier in between. Um, so what happens is that you end up getting a flow of electrical current if you connect the two sides of, these, of this material. And you, what you do is you can get a continuous flow of, or a continuous movement of electrons and of current. And then you can capture that current. And this is a voltage. And that current can then be used in to, to charge a battery or to, 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 to light a light or to, uh, to run your refrigerator, if you will. So again, this is a very, very uh, you know, highly engineered material, uh, very structured material. And that's really the fundamentals of the the solar power, solar energy industry we have today, the photovoltaic cell. So again, with the photovoltaic cells, we can do some basic math. Um, so again, it, it depends, the amount of energy you can capture or that you can generate from the sun is gonna depend on how much area you have. So again, I'm not gonna go through the details, but let's say that um, you are in the middle of the day, the sun was shining at a thousand, uh, let's say a uh, thousand watts per square meter, um, and you had a certain efficiency in your photovoltaic array. And let's say you wanted to generate 3000 watts at noon. So the question would be how much area of solar cells would you need? Um, so what you do is you, you kind of back out the efficiency, 20% efficiency. You figure out the, uh, you have your unknown input power, your output power has to be 3000 and you can figure out, um, how much area you need. So in this case, uh, we calculate 15 square meters. But again, it's not complicated math, um, but this is again, good engineering you know, as estimates of, of how much you need. You need to know what your output needs to be. You, know, you need to know the equations for how you, you calculate. And this is how you design a, um, how you design a, a, a solar uh, cell or a, a solar system. So, the thing is, if you know a little bit about electricity, you, you may know about direct current and alternating current. Now, our power grid runs with alternating current, um, but solar cells actually create a direct current or DC. So the way that works, if you have solar panels on your house, um, you the sun will, will hit the solar panel. It, it creates a current, and then you have a thing called a charge controller. And as I mentioned, you can you can basically charge up your battery. So a battery then is is a way of storing energy, but it only puts out direct current. In order to connect that to the power grid, you need to put it through something called an inverter. And an inverter essentially is, is a, a device that is turning on and off or back and forth, you know, conver converting the, the direct power, direct current electron flow into alternating. So it's making the, the, the electrons move back and forth instead of always in one direction. Um, so the way these solar panels work again is that they are a series of solar solar cells, individual solar cells, 
each of the individual solar cells, which was about a half a volt, um, has to be put in series. And a series circuit looks something like this. Uh, you've probably seen this in your batteries. Um, you know, in your in your the things that you you need to put batteries in. Sometimes they have multiple batteries because you need to hook them up so that they they give you enough voltage for your device. But um, today's today's solar panels are uh, can produce about a 350 watts of power and uh, will typically have about I think 18 volts um, of 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 uh, potential to drive a, a circuit a circuit. Um, oh, actually, sorry, 36 volts. Okay, so we talked about the best place to put a solar, a solar, I mean, sorry, a wind, a wind farm. What about the best place to put a solar plant? Um, as you know, the, the higher the sun is in the sky, uh, the, the, the more power you have, you probably feel that, right? In the, late in the day, early in the morning, you don't get as much direct sunlight, but in the middle of the day, you get a lot. Um, and I mentioned before, you could, you could move your, you, you can have uh, moving solar panels that track the sun. Um, the other the other elements that that go into where to put a solar plant power plant is obviously where when the sun is higher in the sky or rather depending on the season, um, you'll have more direct sunlight uh, near the equator. But again, that doesn't help if you're trying to make power for cities that are far from the equator. But this this uh, picture here shows, some of the potential for where you can get a lot of power from the sun. And it's not just the, the geometry. I mean, geometry is a big part of this. The geometry of the sun versus where your solar plant is matters. But also, you know, the the, the weather is going to make a difference. When there's clouds, you don't get as much, uh, you don't get as many photons hitting your solar panel. Um, and elevation matters in this case, where you have, you have less, uh, uh, if you're at a high altitude, you can get more more uh, solar irradiation that has an impact too. So this is a this is a uh, a design and this is a an industry where geometry and weather is a huge part of figuring out how best to design um, a power plant, a solar power plant. So let's get to what you're going to work on. Um, we've given you some equipment, some parts to, uh, to, to, to build your own hybrid wind and solar plant. So let me show you what you've got or what you should have. First of all, you should have a solar cell and this is a five volt solar cell. The nice thing is that it actually has connectors already on it. And um, this is, you'll see that this is a very simple, simple uh, uh, way of, this is a simple assembly, really. The other thing that you're going to do is you you should have a, a, a light emitting diode, an LED. Now, I think if you got a white one, that would be good to use that for your solar plant, because depending on the color of your LED uh, will depend on how much voltage you need in order to make it light. And uh, the white LED needs the most voltage, and your solar cell is going to be giving you more voltage than your your generator for your wind. Now, a couple of things to notice about the LED. One of the legs on it is longer than the other. And this is really important uh, to know how to connect these so that the LED will light. So the way this should work is you can think of your solar cell as a battery that works when the sun is shining on it. It's going to have a red and a black a lead. The red lead is the, is the positive lead. The black lead is the negative lead. And in order for the LED to light, the current has to flow in a particular direction, which means that the long leg has to be connected to the plus or the red, and the, the, uh, the short leg has to be connected to the, the minus or the black. If you have these reversed, your LED will not light uh, because it only works in one direction of current flow. So that's, that's the, how simple the, the, the solar system is gonna be. The other, the other thing that you're going to be building is a wind turbine, and you're going to be using it to, to light up another LED. Um, in this case, you have a few more pieces of equipment with you. Um, here's your LED again. Uh, again, it has a long leg, a short leg, so you need to make sure that the long leg is connected to the positive uh, end. Oops. Um, you should have some jumper wires because you're going to need them. Uh, and But the key, the key piece of of uh, the wind generator is this thing called a, a generator, basically, which is essentially a, 
a motor that we run in reverse. And the generator will be, you'll be spinning the rotor on your generator using your blades. You should have had some uh, wind turbine blades or some fan blades that you can put onto here. And um, the way you're gonna hook this up is gonna be a little bit different. Now, I mentioned that the generator is really just a motor that runs backwards. So these little motors, if you will, um, the red and the black wires are really designed for a motor. So if you want the motor to run forward, you have your, your red plus black negative. But because we're gonna be running this as a generator, we're gonna, it's gonna be running backwards, it's gonna look different. So in this case, the positive terminal is gonna be the black and the negative terminal is gonna be, be the red. So you're gonna connect your black wire on your generator to the long leg in this case. And then the short leg is gonna go back to the red wire. So that's, that's the basic circuit. So what we want you to do is, is to, to build a device or to build a, uh, a wind turbine solar cell um, in hybrid power uh, capture. Uh, and here are some examples. Here's some that I built that don't look very good. Uh, Anna and Jackie were much better designers than I was. Um, and we want you to build this. You're going to need to build a tower. You're going to have to build, um, we want you to build a little house or a little uh, some, some enclosure so you can see the, the LEDs light up. And um, uh, and it basically have a solar and wind, wind power um, uh, device. So then we need you to test your design. Uh, make sure that you can get both your LEDs to light up. And uh, maybe you can you can uh, you know see design in your classroom and see who, vote to see who has the best uh, architectural design for their house and also architectural design for for their their solar and their wind wind turbines. So uh, be sure to take photos and we're going to want to see see your results as we get to the end of the day uh, in the wrap up. So that's the that's the. Uh, um, that's the introduction. So you're gonna get a chance to do more uh, on this now and, and actually capture some energy from the sun and from, a, from wind. And uh, let me turn it back to, um, to Monica uh, on the next instructions. Well, I wanna say thank you to Eric for leading such a great introduction. And right now we're going to open up our breakout room, but I'm going to... Well, I want to say welcome back to everybody from, I hope you guys had fun building so far. I know you guys are probably like mid project and probably like, why are we starting interrupting this build? But I want to say thank you again to Emily and Julian for leading the breakout rooms. And we have Maddie and Lauren Sawyer who are here to lead your official Q&A for our Renewable Energy Day. But I just want to reiterate, I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but I just want to reiterate that this is your opportunity to ask any questions you have for our mentors. Please feel free to type in chat. And after they introduce themselves, if you want to unmute, you can. We love student engagement. And I'm going to pass it off to uh, Lauren first, but I'm going to share my screen. So hold on one second. Can everybody see that? Yes. I think Monica might have frozen. So I'm just going to kick off the uh, introductions. So um, hey, guys, my name is Lauren Sawyer. I am a grad student at uh, UC San Diego. I'm studying um, a graduate program in mechanical engineering with applications to oceans, ocean technology, and my undergrad was aerospace engineering. And Maddie, do you want to introduce yourself while the screen's frozen? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Madeline. You can call me Maddie. I'm a sophomore at the University of Notre Dame studying electrical engineering. Um, and I'm excited to hear your questions. Looks like Monica might have left, but that's okay. Um, Lord, is there anything else you wanna to share to introduce yourself or should we go ahead and get started with questions? Yeah, we can get started. Uh, you guys will see our little intro slides that we put together eventually uh, when Monica <laughs> pops back in. But yes. for now, uh, let's just, uh, hit it off with some questions. So uh, if the schools could please post in chat any questions that you guys have um, about anything about this lab in particular, about college, about 
you know, what got us started in engineering, which we might just kick off with anyway, uh, while you guys are thinking. Uh, so Maddie, do you want to talk about like why electrical engineering for you? Sure. Um, so the first question was kind of why engineering in general was the kind of first decision I had to make. And for me in high school, I just, I really enjoyed my math and science classes. You know, those were the things that I thought were so cool and interesting. And I, I constantly wanted to learn more about. And so as I was trying to make my decision about a major in college, I was kind of drawn towards engineering because it's a good way to combine math and science. Um, and I also liked that there was this problem solving element and that there's this element of collaboration. When you're an engineer, you work on a lot of um, teams, you work with a lot of different people to solve problems. And so all of those things kind of drew me to engineering in general. Um, I actually came into college my freshman year as a mechanical engineering major. Um, and the reason for that was that it just felt like mechanical engineering is a very broad um, kind of subsection of engineering. So I think that that was a good place for me to start to be able to kind of explain sorry, explore the different um, parts of engineering within that. Um, and then over the course of my freshman year, I got a lot of opportunities to not only explore the different engineering majors in my classes, but also to talk to professors, talk to upperclassmen, um, just research what the curriculum at my college looked like. And through all those things, I kind of realized that electrical engineering sounded really cool to me. Um, and then my spring semester, I took my first electrical engineering course, which was a course called Embedded Systems, which was a lot of just like building circuits, starting to kind of learn to code. Um, and I love that class. And so that was, I made the switch from mechanical to electrical. And I think that was definitely the right decision for me. Um, Lauren, what about you? How did you choose um, aerospace? Yeah, so mine's kind of a, a funny story. Um, so I, same thing, I thought I wanted to be an engineer like junior, senior year of high school, kind of late on the uptake for that. Uh, freshman, sophomore year, I really wanted to be a baker. So a huge 180 um, in terms of what I wanted to do with my life. And, you know, I've still got that baking dream on the back burner, maybe uh, after, you know, a few 20 years in engineering. But um, basically what it came down to is I loved that math and science could describe the way the physical world worked. And so I'm like, wow, okay, maybe engineering is a really cool way to go, but I'm not really interested in um, building bridges or like all those stereotypical things you think of when you think of engineering, uh, building buildings. And uh, actually, uh, I'm glad we have Maddie on board here because I did not take well to electrical engineering. I'm like, oh, this is too small and I can't physically see it. And I hate that. <laughs> so um, I just didn't know what to do as an engineer. And so I did some research in my senior year of high school. And I realized that when I was watching all those ocean documentaries that I loved to watch and that I really had a passion for, that someone had to build all of that technology, the, the submarines, the autonomous vehicles, all of the sensors. And I'm like, well, what if I built all that? You know, I'm not really interested in doing the research for the ocean uh, data myself, but what if I built all of those things? So I kind of took that into college and I studied aerospace because I wanted to get a handle on fluid dynamics. Uh, aerospace is the study of fluid dynamics through air and I wanted to apply it underwater. And now, um, unlike Maddie who started out in mechanical and then was like, mm, I think I wanna to go to electrical. I started out in aerospace and realized that ocean technology actually falls under the broader category of mechanical. Aerospace was too specified. Um, so now I'm doing my master's in mechanical engineering. Like I said, I get to apply it to ocean technology now. Um, I'm over at UC San Diego, which has the wonderful Scripps Institute of Oceanography. I work on like a cliffside that looks out on the ocean. It's amazing. Um, and I get to build autonomous vehicles that are going to be able to go underwater and we attach different sensors to them and we collect a lot of oceanographic data, whether it's for people's PhDs or military applications. Um, we do kind of all of that stuff. So it's been such a really cool path to follow, especially knowing that I didn't want to start out with something that was familiar to me and I kind of had to search for it and search for it and finally I found this little place where I could achieve my passion. So even if things don't sound great to you like right now if you're like well engineering is cool but 
nothing really appeals to me that I'm hearing of. These labs are a great way to get all of that uh, exposure to maybe things that you wouldn't have thought about before. Yeah, and then I think Monica's having some technical difficulties, but I can share our slides real quick. Thanks, um, I don't know, Lauren, if there's anything um, that you want to show off here. Yeah, so uh, this is a little bit of a background about me. Um, I graduated from Penn State University um, just last May. Um, that's my dog, Jasmine. She and I did a degree in aerospace together, and I was able to minor in marine sciences. And then, uh, like I said, uh, if you click the next slide, yeah. This is where I work now. Um, I work at a marine physical laboratory at Scripps Institute of Ocean Technology. And I focused on autonomous vehicles. So vehicles that kind of have their own brain and think for themselves um, in my senior year of undergrad. And so now I'm really gonna work on my thesis for autonomous vehicles. I'm hoping to work on some of the autonomous submarines that we have in the lab and kind of give my expertise and get more refined knowledge about them so I can take that in to the workforce. Nice, Lauren, everything you're doing is so interesting and so cool. <laughs> um, and then here's my slide. Um, I kind of mentioned some of these things already that I'm majoring in electrical engineering, um, but I do have a couple slides talking about kind of what I've been doing into college. Maybe that'll spark some questions for you guys. Um, so in high school, I talked about, I kind of started to realize that engineering might be the right path for me just based on my interests and what was exciting to me. Um, and then when I got to Notre Dame, I started to join um, a bunch of different engineering clubs. Um, one of the cool things about college is a lot of colleges have really cool extracurriculars that you can get involved with. So for example, one thing for me was a club called Enable ND, where we build or design and build low cost prosthetics. So for example, last year, um, we had a user who was a four-year-old girl with a limb difference, and we built her a functioning prosthetic arm that was low cost. We 3D printed it. We put it together with strings and screws. Um, and then this semester, I'm actually working with the same user, but we're trying to build her a myoelectric prosthesis. And if you're not aware what that is, a myoelectric prosthesis is basically a prosthetic device, but it has some sort of electronic components. So our goal is um, we'll attach some sensors to her arm and whenever she flexes certain muscles, it will like close the hand. Um, and so it'll give her a little bit more strength in closing it. Whereas her last device, she had to bend her elbow in order to close the hand. Um, and then over the summer, I got the awesome opportunity to work with Engineering Tomorrow as a summer intern, helping to design some new labs and update some labs. Um, and then this semester, one of my favorite things that I'm doing is I'm working in a research lab as an undergraduate. Um, and it's a research lab that focuses on the kinematics of bio-inspired robots. So if you look at this slide in the bottom right, that's my robot that's um, inspired by a salamander. So it moves in the same way, it has the same gait as a salamander would. Um, and then the top right, that's my lab group. And then I also have some pictures of the hands we're building. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that I can see the chat again. Um, I don't know, but if you guys have any questions, again, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I don't know, Lauren, do you want to talk about maybe some of the, your favorite projects you worked on in college or now? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, one thing I want to point out first, though, is... Maddie and I both are doing stuff with robots and yet we're such different like fields in engineering. Uh, and I think that it's a really cool thing to point out that we all need each other. You know, I can't do any of that wiring and the sensor uh, integration. That's all electrical engineers, but the electrical engineers need mechanical engineers to figure out the motion, the kinematics of how things move and how we can apply that to a robot. So everything works together. And uh, even if you love robots and you're like, oh, like, um, I don't want to figure out how those move. The the wiring is way more interesting to me. You can be exactly like Maddie and do all the electrical components of those and still work on robots. So um, I think that's a really cool thing about engineering is you get to work with so many disciplines. Um, but yeah, favorite project is hard. <laughs> um, 
let's see, in my senior year, I was able to build an autonomous drone. And unfortunately, the autonomous drone slammed face first into a wall the night before competition. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't get to fly it in competition. But the experience of having a full year to work uh, with a lab group, I had three other, four other teammates um, that were in my group and we had kind of specializations. I was the one who took over the control systems of the uh, autonomous drone. And that's basically transforming the physics of flying. How do we get this thing up in the air into a code that says, okay, we need this much power to spin the propellers and we need this much thrust on the propellers to get the actual drone in the air. And this is how we tell that drone to do it itself, essentially. Um, and so that was my specialization as well as just all of the building. We all had to work together. Um, and, and yeah, it was a great experience. Uh, definitely failure is such a huge part in engineering. and. Seeing that drone fly face first into the wall, I was like, you know what? I'm still proud of what we did. I know that we don't have anything to present tomorrow, but we worked so hard on everything we did and we got it to fly in the end. So it was still a success in my book. All right, Maddie, you wanna take the first couple questions? Yeah, sure. So I see one is about the salamander robot. What types of sensors are used in the limbs? Um, so for the robot that I'm building specifically, right now it doesn't have um, any sensors. It's just, we have a microcontroller board. So like if you're familiar with Arduino, um, it's an Arduino board. And then it's connected to each leg has two motors. And then there's one motor that connects the spine. So that way each leg has the functionality to move up or down and back and forward. And then the body can bend um, sort of right and left. And so right now I just have it programmed to where I can input data that changes um, what the gait is like. So if the back left and front right leg are moving synchronously or if I wanna try something else, um, but definitely moving forward, I do wanna try to incorporate sensors. Um, there are a lot of robots in the lab that I'm working with that are trying to use sensors to create robots that can essentially see obstacles in their path. So there's a lot of cool things going on with that. Like I have um, one of my peers is building a robot that can kind of sense different colors and um, do different things according to that. So kind of like a red light, green light, if you see red, stop, if you see green, go kind of situation. Um, so my robot, not specifically, but that is a great idea. And it's definitely um, sensors are being incorporated more and more in these bio-inspired robot um, kind of projects. So that's a great question. And then Lauren, I wasn't on a first robotics team. Were you by any chance? I see we had a couple questions asking that. No, I actually, uh, I wasn't. I not heard of first robotics. Um, and I didn't actually discover that I liked robotics until about my junior or senior year of college. So um, yeah, I didn't join any extracurriculars uh, for robotics. But to touch on the sensor question real quick, I know it was about the salamander and I don't wanna take away from that, but um, for autonomous vehicles and most robots in general, like Maddie said, um, you need sensors to quote unquote see, so for the actual vehicle itself to see. And of course it doesn't use eyesight the same way we use eyesight. And so there are a bunch of different sensors that you can use to ensure that it doesn't bump into something. One of them is called LIDAR. And if you guys have heard of sonar, that's with sound. LIDAR is with light. And it basically sends pulses of light and then sees how long it takes for them to reflect back to the sensor. And once it does that, it can kind of gauge because we know the speed of light, we know the speed at which that travels, we can gauge how far away that whatever thing that bounced the light back is. And so that's something that my drone used, uh, stuff in the lab uses a lot of sonar because sound actually propagates better underwater and light does not um, travel as well underwater. Actually, you can't see certain colors of light underwater because those rays aren't deep enough uh, or long enough to penetrate the deep layers of water. And it's literally only like, I think 12 feet down, you start to lose red. Uh, in your vision. So I did an experiment with this when I was getting scuba certified. I wore a red swimsuit, it was bright red, and it looked kind of like brownish greenish. So if you're like red green colorblind, that's kind of what it looks like underwater. Um, 
So light isn't as good underwater, but sound is amazing underwater. So we use sonar when we're doing that same kind of uh, sensing. And then there's a lot with um, cameras nowadays. And that in terms of like what you think about with us seeing is the drone seeing, but there's image recognition. So there are uh, AI softwares that are used to determine like whether people are wearing masks in public, they can identify a mask and that's machine learning. And that's basically training something to identify a certain image. And so cameras are also along with machine learning uh, used a lot of sensors. So I hope that gave you a little bit more uh, insight in terms of sensors. I'm just hopping. I want to say sorry for that technical difficulty. Your 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 slides were too too impressive for my computer to handle. So, <laughs> with these two impressive ventures we have on the line, I just want to invite any school. If you don't feel comfortable typing in chat, please unmute and ask our mentors some questions. We love we love student engagement. I know I see they're busy in the classrooms with their builds. You can also ask questions about your design. If you need some tips, any questions are welcome. Do not be shy. Yeah, Maddie, do you want to talk about uh, one of your favorite projects? Yeah, sure. Um, it is a tough question. I would say my favorite project from my freshman year would probably be my final for that embedded systems course that I was mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, and so our final for that course was kind of to use everything that we learned about circuits and programming to make some sort of entertaining game or just some sort of project with functionality. And so my partner and I for the project created a kind of reflex timer game. So we had a couple sensors and we had a countdown on the LCD screen. And then whenever the countdown went off, you would both try to tap your sensor first and then it would you know, tell you who had the fastest reaction time and, and how many milliseconds or nanoseconds you reacted, which was kind of fun. Um, and that was just interesting to me because Last semester was kind of my first opportunity to really get into circuits and see how that all works. So that was um, really fun for me. Um, and then also this semester, I took an intro to electrical engineering course. And one of my favorite things that we did was we had one lab where we built a AM radio. And so that was kind of fun where I got to practice soldering and um, incorporating, you know, resistors, capacitors, all these things into a circuit that actually functioned and I could get um, at least a couple uh, AM radio frequencies to play on my radio. Um, in my dorm, I think I can only get Notre Dame football talk radio, but uh, no complaints here. <laughs> um, so that was definitely a really cool thing that I got to do this semester. Um, and then I see we have another question. Did you participate in pre-college engineering programs activities? What organizations? Lauren, do you wanna take that one first? Yeah, uh, my answer is a little bit boring because I totally did not. I spent most of high school thinking that I wanted nothing to do with engineering. My dad's an electrical engineer and in a true child fashion, you know, I'm like, I don't want anything to do with what my parents did. Like I wanna carve my own path and here I am as an engineer, not an electrical engineer, but still an engineer. <laughs> so I actually did not uh, participate in anything pre-college. College is my first like really delve into engineering um, and all the engineering like organizations that I was a part of in college were like women in engineering programs, society of women engineers. I was a part of the honor societies for aerospace and general engineering, uh, but I didn't do any of like those clubs where you actually build something, uh, which would have been cool. But my hobbies were actually uh, more sports oriented. So I swam for four years on the club team. Uh, that all being said, I highly recommend if uh, you're interested in engineering and you want more experience to join uh, any of those organizations in college. A lot of um, a lot of universities have a Formula One uh, race car team where you build and race your own race car and there's a national competition and it's such great experience and you learn so much about aerodynamics electrical systems uh, mechanical systems how to build something that's stable following the safety regulations i know that that's a fantastic club um but if you haven't got a chance to join a club uh just know that it was successful for me like you're not behind you're completely where you're supposed to be and uh don't feel like you're behind just because 
maybe you want to do other clubs instead of just um, engineering based clubs. So that's my uh, bit of advice. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, honestly, I didn't really do that much with engineering in high school specifically. Um, my high school didn't have engineering specific courses or anything like that. And we didn't really have a lot of engineering clubs either. Um, one thing that I did do was some friends and I started a girls in STEM club at our high school where we did have some engineering activities with that kind of learning about the, what the different fields were, what the different majors were together. Um, and we got a chance to talk to some um, in professional engineers too. We were kind of trying to coordinate that, but I didn't, I wasn't on a robotics team or anything like that. So like Lauren said, don't feel behind if you're not doing that, but also if you're interested in that, I encourage you to do it. Um, and it's never too early to kind of get started with those things. Um, and like Lauren was saying, once you get to college, there are so many cool opportunities that you can do with extracurriculars. Um, I mentioned some of the things that I'm involved in, but I know that also at my college, there's other engineering clubs. I know that we have a hybrid club, which is similar to what Lauren was saying about building a Formula One car, but this club is specifically for a competition that races hybrid or electric vehicles. So that's kind of cool. Um, kind of relevant to what you guys are learning about with renewable energy today. Um, there's also a club at my college called Irish that, Irish because we're Notre Dame, but um, the goal of the club is to build or submit a proposal to NASA um, of this, what we call a cube satellite, which is essentially just a kind of small satellite. Um, and NASA accepts proposals from teams, I think mainly college teams. Um, and then at the end of the year, they give feedback to everyone and select one satellite to actually launch, which is kind of a cool, um, cool opportunity. So definitely, um, if you're close to college, look into the different extracurriculars that different colleges have, and they're probably really a lot of exciting things that you can get involved with. Um, and then I see we have another question. What tips would you have for anyone going into engineering? That's a great question. Um, I think for me, it would my biggest piece of advice is to never be afraid to ask for help. Um, especially as your student and you're going to face a lot of challenges, you know, some of your classes, no matter what your major is, are going to be difficult, but you have so many resources available to you in college of people that really want to see you succeed. So don't be afraid to ask your professors questions, to go to office hours, um, to talk to your TAs and ask them questions, to reach out to your peers and create study groups. Uh, never feel like you have to, you know, solve it all by yourself and figure it all out by yourself. Um, but Lauren, what would your advice be for anyone going into engineering? I think that that's fantastic advice. Um, my advice is kind of twofold um, and it starts with perseverance. An engineer isn't like someone who's a genius. You know, we think of all of the um, big wigs who own like companies and are billionaires and they're geniuses, but you don't have to be a genius to be an engineer. You just have to keep trying and keep persevering and not say this failure is going to set me back or this failure is going to stop me. And on that note, <laughs> there will be failures. I remember freshman year is the first time I got what I considered a failing grade on a test. I had never gotten less than a 60 on anything ever. I don't think I'd even gotten less than a 70 in high school. And then I got this exam back and I'm like, oh, I failed. And not only did I not do well, but everyone else did well. So I wasn't even like near the average or anything. And like, it's so disheartening, but I'm still here. I still graduated and I took that exam and I said I don't want that to happen again and I went and I studied for the final and I still managed a really good grade in the class and you know it did happen again <laughs> like I'm not going to say that I haven't failed since freshman year like that's not the case at all um there have been many exams many classes that just don't make sense to me and actually some of them have been electrical engineering <laughs> classes we just don't get along electrical engineering and I um and so I would just say that, yeah, it's gonna happen, but it's your reaction to the failure that makes you a really good engineer. All right, Maddie, you wanna take the next question? Sure, so I see that we have another one about advice. So I'm guessing that's kind of a similar answer. And then I see that we have one that's 
what are the stereotypes about engineering, if any that you feel gives engineering a bad name? Um, I do think that some of you might have heard, you know, engineering is so hard, or if you study engineering in college, you won't have time for friends or anything like that. Um, and I'm here to tell you that that is not true. Um, all of my engineering major friends have time to be social, to have friends, to have fun. Um, I think one big thing about going into college is you just have to learn to manage your time. And you do eventually to kind of figure out the routines that work for you where, you know, you have time to get all of your things done, all of your work done, but you also have plenty of time in the day to, you know, make time to see other people, to see your friends, all of that. So I would say maybe there is a stereotype out there about engineering being too hard or time consuming, but I disagree with it. Don't buy into it. Um, what about you, Lauren? Yeah, same thing. Um, actually, ironically, aerospace is, you know, considered a really hard major. And ironically, I met all of my best aerospace friends at club swim, which meant we all had time to do club swim as an extracurricular. And there's something about aerospace engineers and swimming. I don't know what that is. There were so many of us, but uh, that's actually how I met all my aerospace peers that became my best friends. It wasn't in classes, it was at club swim. And then the other thing is that like, oh, you're so nerdy, you know, like you don't, you're not good at socializing. And it, there are people like that, you know, like I've met at a couple of really awkward people and like they're honestly really great and super smart but engine like people just enjoy engineering and people just enjoy math and science and you're going to meet so many different people in engineering and you're going to meet the people who are really good at communicating with others you're going to meet the people who maybe like aren't so good at public speaking but really are behind the scenes forces and you need everyone like it's not just a bunch of nerds sitting in a room together in complete silence because they don't know how to talk to each other and I say this from the perspective that I'm a total nerd and I love like fantasy books and everything else so like I don't look down on that kind of nerdy aspect I honestly embrace it and love it and in college you don't get teased for it or anything it's like do whatever you enjoy and do what makes you happy well, on that note, I'm going to hop in because our Q&A time has run out. I want to say thank you to Maddie and Lauren for leading such a great Q&A session. Thank you to all those who contributed great questions in chat. We appreciate that. And I'm going to see if I can share my screen one more time uh, and just put up the agenda again. We're going to open up those breakout rooms. We have Lauren, who's going to stay behind in a breakout room, as well as Brianna, who's going to be joining a breakout room. If you need any 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 uh, assistance, this is your opportunity in the breakout room to ask any questions. So Brianna and Lauren can hop into the breakout room and then we will see you back in the main room for our wrap up at 1230. So about 29 minutes, get building again. And thank you again to Maddie and Lauren.
I want to say welcome back to everybody. And we are here. We have Dr. Eric Einstein. I hope you guys have had a great time building. I know you probably have some redesigns that you want to keep working on on these projects, but we are ready for our wrap up. And this is your time to share what you created. And I'm going to stop speaking and let Dr. Einset take it away to lead your wrap up for renewable energy. All right. Thanks, Monica. And uh, I hope everybody had some fun with this lab. Uh, it is nice and hands-on, and I, well, I think what's kind of cool about it is that we were able to provide you with some, you know, specialty materials with these solar cells and a little generator and things like that. So, um, so first, I just want to get some feedback and maybe see some of the uh, the things that you guys have built. I know there's this is there's a lot of people on the line here, but uh, okay, we got George Washington. Yeah. Carver. Uh, I can see that one. Okay. There we, we, there we, we go. Did. Your pins. Can we bring that one back? Bring that back. We want to see what you built. Okay. Oh, wow. You can unmute and talk about it. So it's working, except that, um, so we have our turbine. I took some other pieces apart because I was trying to put it by the window right now. But when it's by yeah. the window, we have the solar panel powering the turbine. And then attached to the light that's in here. Oh, so you're actually you're actually running the fan with the solar with the solar pan panel. Yeah, so it's on and off. Sometimes it works, and the mm -hmm. turbine is spinning and the light is on, and then sometimes the light will come on. But I think it has to do with the amount of. Um, okay. No. Good. Good. That's good. So yeah, I mean, a lot. I think many of you figured out that. That you can use the solar cell to actually run the fan. Um, what we were actually trying to do was have you do two separate circuits, one solar cell running one LED, and then the uh, fan or the turbine running another LED. But that's good too. It just goes to show you can you can you can combine these things. So great. Anybody else want to show their their house or their uh Okay, I, Preston. I see Preston. Let me pin them for everybody to see. Hey, mm -hmm. Preston, you can unmute and talk to us about your design. Hi, so we went the more cost efficient route. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So we like didn't really build a house. We have more of like a shack structure type thing going on. Okay. Mm -hmm. But both the solar panel and the wind the turbine. Oh, Do you hook up the LEDs? Did you did you hook up the LEDs to light no, up? Yeah, the LEDs? Yes, they're both hooked up inside and all over the Okay, all over. excellent. Very good. Very good. Nice job. <laughs> it's nice to see Preston. We, we used to do a lot of live labs there. So I know that room well. <laughs> Anybody else want to show? Is that I think we have Duval High School, right? Oh, excellent, Duval. Let's see what you got. Oh, nice. Very nice. So you used, so what What did you build your tower out of? Is that wrapped paper or how did you build your tower? Hello, Ms. McKinsey. Sorry, I had to unmute for him. Um, so the top is actually built out of wooden sticks, like tiny okay. wooden sticks. And I just put it down a tube shaft of, of cardboard. So it's like firm and it's like a stability. And then I'm running dual panels. Very nice. Yeah, no, that's right. great. And my top is the same wooden sticks, except my shaft isn't running all the way down to allow some space for wiring to poke out. And right. I also ran dual panels. One here okay, great. One here. Excellent. Did you get your LEDs to light up? Did you get them both to light up with the uh, the sun uh, and yeah. uh, the turbine? The lights did light up and the windmill did spin. Okay. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to get the, the, the wind turbine to generate enough voltage to light the LEDs. You have to blow them, blow on them really hard or just get try to get them spinning as quickly as you can. But they should work. They should. You should be able to light the LEDs with that too. Nice job. And that's a, a good point. You know, the structure and how you design the tower is important. Um, very nice. That's a, that's a different design. Talk about that one. How what? How did you guys come up with that design? 
Curtis High School. Can you unmute? Curtis. Yeah. What? Hold on. There you go. Now try. <laughs> what? No, he asked you how you came up with that design. Uh, it was a free, with the It was a freestyle. Yeah. Freestyle. That come. That's a good start. Yeah. So show him the uh, the solar path panel. Oh, uh, oh wait, I'm doing this. But there you go. Have, and how many do you have lit? Six. Six. Six by the wind. One by the solar. <laughs> So seven, we, have a, we have a solar panel on top too. Okay, excellent. That's great. Thank you. Let me see the back, back side. So did, you said you had six LEDs? No. Yeah, Inside. six by the fan, one by the solar, solar panel. And, and did they all light? Could you get them all to yeah. light at once? Yeah. That's hard to tell. Yeah. yeah. It's... Nice. <laughs> Well done. Very nice, Curtis High School. I see. Um, I see Green County. Or could do you have any audio, Green County, so we can I you can it. share? I we can hear you. I see a beautiful yeah. design. Right. So what my students did was they took a former lab that we had done of aerodynamics and added the uh, engine, replaced the propeller, and added a new source. So maybe one day we can have electric flying. Right, right. Yeah. You guys really went rogue on me here. That's great, though. <laughs> Pretty cool, I think. That's good. Actually, you know, that reminds me. There's a there's a famous airplane that was designed, and it wasn't a very useful airplane, but it was for one person. But it was totally solar powered, and it was, and they were able to fly it around the world. Oh, waiting for him to finish. But it took a long time. One day that'll come back again once we're able to get solar power and some of these alternative sources, you know, a little bit yeah. more stable. Yeah. No, very good. That's great. All nice right, job. Thanks. <laughs> Academy of Mount St. Ursula. So this, for this one, I have the solar panel connected to this propeller. What? Oh. Okay. So the solar panel runs the uh, runs the fan. Uh, so I have the solar panel uh, with the wiring. <laughs> so uh, I have cable management over here to go to the back of this. Okay. So it doesn't look messy, and this is okay. No, that's great. Yeah. Very good. And you got you, and you were you able to light up the LEDs? Yes. Okay. Very good. Nice job. I have okay. To Thank Academy you. of Mount St. Ursula wants to present next. Let me spotlight them for everybody. All right, Academy of Mount St. Ursula, you're up. Okay, so we made a house and we made yeah. a little panel. Uh, and we put the And then I put the So when you put the flash, so okay great oh yeah i can see it i can see the led very good nice very good so you got yeah the, the solar panel works well yeah nice job i like i like the tower just a, a folded cardboard tower that was uh that's kind of how i did it myself when i built one too okay. Maria Regina, you are you ready? Go for it. Okay, so we the house and we made it pink. Wow. Uh, what did you put on the cover of the house? What what's that? Custom tape. Okay. Great. And and so where's your solar where's your solar panel? We didn't get to that yet. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Very nice. I, St. Joseph had their hand up. Are you guys ready to, to share? St. Joseph Regional? There we go. I'm ready. I'm ready. Get a little closer to the camera so we can see it. So one group at a time for us. I can see a fan spinning over onto the right to the side there. 
One solar panel allows for the wind turbine to move and then lights up a light in the back as well. And then the other uh, solar panel lights a red light inside the house. Ah, okay. So I get a little light in the in the house that lights up the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. That's a that's quite a nice that's a great looking house. So basically, you you had multiple solar cells. One. Uh, yeah, I had one here and then one on the other side. Yeah. That's great. One likes the light in the back and the uh, makes the turbine yep. and the other lights up the house. Yeah, and I also like how you had them separate separate elements. It's a little like a grid. You have the house and then you but you have the uh, the grid that connects the the salt the uh, the wind turbine to it. Very nice. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. All right, next question, let's go. It looks like you got sunshine there, which is good. It... Yeah. It's all the way up to the Okay. So you got it hooked up so the solar cell is running the turbine, right? Yeah. Nice. What, what, what material is that? That your tower. Your tower is a uh, looks. Okay. So you had some extra material. It's very good. Nice job. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> have, maybe, are there any other schools that, that yeah. want to share? Like an entire How about Mom Ford Academy? Yeah, an entire one school. more? One more? Do you have another one you wanted to share, Mr. Kim? We can't hear you. Can't hear you. Oh. All right. That's okay. Is I tell you what, why don't we, why don't we, why don't we um, stop it there and I'll get, show you a few more. We'll, we'll finish off with a little bit of a discussion. It looks like you guys have all figured these things out. Actually, it's interesting. You're, you're, you seem to be doing more using the solar cell to run your fan, which is fine. I mean, it's just a different circuit, but you guys have figured that out. Um, normally, what we were what we were getting at was that you would use your solar cell as one source of energy to light up one LED, and you could use your wind turbine um, to as another source of energy to to light up your other LED. But um, I think you guys have got this all figured out, so that's good good stuff. Let me let me share a few more slides. Talk about a few more things before we get to our um, our guest speaker here. So let me share my screen again. So first of all, nice job. Um, some of the things that you know you should think about maybe within within the classroom or just just as a, you know amongst yourselves is um, what is the problem that we're trying to solve here with with uh, with renewable energy? Because that's the thing about engineering is that engineers are working on on trying to solve problems. I mean, we you know, engineers use math and basics of science and fundamentals of common sense. To try to to try to, to to build and scale up and build things that uh, are are good for the good of society, uh, and to solve problems. And I think you know you guys can think about what are the things that uh, what are the benefits of renewable energy. Um, and now, also, what was the process process you went through when you when you figured out how you were going to design this thing? We like to have. Um, you know, when you students working in groups, and that's kind of how typically how engineering works anyway. You're you're never on your own uh, when it comes to building something or designing something that's on a large scale, uh, because 
everybody can make a mistake and not everybody has all the, the ideas. So you want to have the power of having many, many, many people involved um, to help check what you're trying to do to uh, come up with new ideas. Um, it always is it better to work as a team uh, and the, the output is always much, much richer and, and uh, uh, better, better suited to what the problem you're trying to solve as you work as a team. So you might want to think about how that worked for you guys. And I don't know if you had a chance to iterate or if there were things you had to overcome. Maybe the, the circuit didn't work right at the first time. Um, but that's the other part of engineering is that you're always, it's kind of a constant, um, you know, thinking about what you've learned, trying things if they don't work. Think about why didn't they work? What what do you learn from that? And and not you know failing or not getting the right answer right away is is not a problem because you're it's an iterative process. So that's that's one of the nice things about engineering is uh, it, it it can be quite fun you know to try to figure out you know how do you get to the end state you're trying to get to. So I know from the first part of the day today, somebody asked you know right out of the gates. How much does an engineer make? So here, here are some numbers um, that that basically just shows uh, typical annual range wages. And I think the more important numbers, instead of these big ones in the middle here, look at the ranges because it's going to depend on how how long you've been working as an engineer. You know what industry you're in, um, wh what where you live, uh, you know how in demand your skills are, and then as you get more and more experience and can prove that you're a good engineer and can actually uh, solve problems and add a lot of value, then, you know, your, your salary will go up and, and you'll be more and more valuable. So that should give you a sense of, of what engineering is, is all about when it comes to, um, uh, you know, salaries. And, and again, you can move to all kinds of, do all kinds of different things with an engineering foundation. And that's what I did. I mean, I started out as a chemical engineer um, but I've worked on, uh, I've worked obviously in, in the chemical industries and pharmaceutical, I've worked in the materials industries. Um, I even worked in, you know, in airports, working on airport capacity. I've worked in on seaports and I'm working on renewable energy. So there's a lot of things you can do. And more importantly than the, the money that you're making, obviously you want to make money, which is nice, um, is kind of enjoying the work and, and being able to move into different areas. So there's a lot of stuff that could be done, and there's a lot of activity going on all over the world with renewable energy, not only solar, not only wind uh, energy, but also solar energy. Um, you know, they, they talk about building larger and larger wind farms or solar farms that can provide more and more um, energy for the world. Uh, one of the issues with renewable energy is that it, this electricity that you generate, it's hard to store. Uh, you guys know all about batteries, you know, you know how batteries work, but you can't for the scale of energy and power needed um, for our electrical grid, we can't build enough batteries to, to store that much. So, and as you know, from renewable energy, it's not always on. If the wind's not blowing, you're not making any wind power. If the sun's not shining, you're not making any solar power. So the, what really you really need to do is, is build a whole infrastructure uh, that includes some energy storage uh, along with um, uh, the, the actually energy generation. And just as, a, as an aside here, if you're interested in, and if, this, if you find this interesting, we have a separate uh, lab uh, called the Power Grid. It's, it explains how the Power Grid works and um, it'll, it'll take you through kind of the fundamentals of how it works and also what are the things that are important um, in terms of um, you know, how we can we manage the power grid. Uh, and there's actually some simulations that you can do where you can be a grid operator uh, turning on and off certain sources of power um, as, as conditions change and, uh, and trying to keep the grid working because uh, you know, with, with climate change, with the, the, the severity of storms that we do see now in the world, all over the world, there's a lot more uh, risk to power grids all over the world. And, and um, it's important that we build resilience and you can learn more about that in the power grid lab. So some of the challenges of wind power, um, you know, it, some of these things came up in the questions. Um, there was questions about, about the, how environmentally friendly is it? 
And it's really all, it's all a balance here because every, every power source has its pros and cons. And you have to figure out, you know, how do you reduce the impact of the negatives of any system um, while maximizing the benefits of that system? So, uh, you know, there has to be constant focus on making sure that, uh, you know, the ecosystem and it doesn't have these, these, uh, these uh, power, power sources don't have neg you know, overly negative impact on the, the ecosystem and the environment. Um, it, the challenges with wind also are that uh, a lot of people, you know, people don't necessarily want to see a wind turbine in their backyard or near them. So that is that is a definite challenge right now for offshore wind, because um, there's there's a lot of activity going on in the U.S. to build offshore wind farms, uh, particularly along the, the the East Coast, and um, they have to they have to get it right. They have to figure out how do we get it you know built with the supply chain at the proper cost, but also in a way that um, doesn't impact the environment negatively. Um, and also get people around uh, and people on board with that. This is an important source of energy. Uh, it's an important uh, solution to a lot of the problems that we have uh, in the growth we have in our country. Of course, you know the, the, the growing demand for power can also be helped not just by building more power plants, but also by using more efficient um, power systems like the LED versus the, the conventional light bulb. Um, so the more every every kilowatt or kilowatt hour that you save by not spending it is just as good as one that you didn't have to generate and create. So, so it's a, it's a holistic problem that, that engineers are working on in many ways. Speaking more about offshore wind, one of the challenges there is, uh, is finding uh, the, the, basically the foundations. Um, right now, offshore wind is, is pretty good to use if your depth of your ocean or depth of the water depth is somewhere between 10 and maybe 50 meters. But for deeper than that uh, is just too deep to put a monopile in and to put a foundation into the ground. So there's a lot of work going on with floating foundations. So essentially you're, you can see some pictures here where you actually have floating, um, large floating structures with a wind turbine on top. And um, somehow they have to be, they will be attached to, to somewhere, but um, it's, a, it's a whole new area of, of development that engineers are working on all over the world, actually. It's, it's a totally new technology. There's, there's you know, no, nobody has the definitive design for this yet, and there may never be a definitive design. But I think what you're going to do is you're going to see more and more uh, floating wind, uh, offshore wind, you know, in the next 10 to 20 years. And that the reason the reason offshore wind is is so interesting and attractive is you know, some of the things that we talked about earlier. The fact that that uh, there's actually a lot of wind offshore. Uh, you can put larger equipment offshore, and um, uh, but with, again, we have to overcome the challenges. And some of the challenges are the visibility of the turbines, the um, the electro electrical transmission, and you know that eventually has to come on shore. Uh, but offshore wind is a big is a big deal, and uh, we are we are uh, you know, in fact my company is is a, is a very active in designing in designing that. Um, for offshore wind, I had mentioned that you can get larger and larger turbines. This just shows you kind of a scale of one of the one of the more recent designs, something called the Haliata X, which is a GE turbine. You can give get an idea of how big these things are. I don't know if you you guys have ever seen the the Eiffel Tower or the Statue of Liberty, but you can get an idea of the scale of these things. They're they're very large turbines, um, and again, this just shows the the size of these turbines. That it the largest commercial aircraft in the world is called an A380. It's an Airbus 380, and here you can see how big that is compared to these turbines. And it really is a is amazing how large these turbines are. Um, so. In order for all this to work, whether it's wind or solar, um, you know, this has to be cost effective. So it, it has to pay back. Um, and one of the things that these developers of this, these, this, uh, these assets um, have to consider is what is it going to cost? Um, when do I get my money back? What, what's the payback time? 
um, and uh, you know who's going to finance it. So that is a that is an element of all this. A uh, couple of other solar power creations, I guess you could say. I mean, that are being developed. Uh, can you what what about if you could build a building that had windows in it, but those windows were actually solar panels, so that you could actually get solar energy out of them? That that is one of the ideas uh, where you could build a building and then it could it could essentially use or produce electricity it needed or a large portion of the electricity. So that's a this is a big material science problem uh, that uh, that uh, people are working on. And there's, you may have heard about the Tesla, I think it's the, the roof shingles that are actually solar cells. I'm not so sure that that has, that has been successful economically yet, but uh, it's just another example of how do we do more? How do we leverage our understanding of, of um, solar energy and materials to, to, uh, to, to make more, more effective and more efficient um, um, sources of, of capturing renewable energy? So, that is that's the end of kind of the wrap up. Uh, again, I I hope you enjoyed this. But now we we actually are quite lucky to have a guest speaker, um, and I'd like to turn it over to Megan if she would uh, to introduce Alex, who has been a um, a friend of Engineering Tomorrow from the beginning and um, has really done uh, quite a lot in her career. So she'll tell you a little bit more about that, but. Uh, Megan, do you want to? Yep, I'm here. Thank you, Eric. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Barrett, the Director of Operations at Engineering Tomorrow. Thanks for being here today, and thanks for doing such a great job, students. Um, before we transition to introducing Alex, um, I'm not exactly sure how we do a Zoom standing ovation, um, but let's do whatever the equivalent of that is for Dr. Eric Einset, a renewables expert. Um, I hope that you really took a lot away from Eric's presentation. Um, he's truly an expert in the field and he is really dedicated to engineering tomorrow and its mission to delivering engineering education to all of you. So thank you, Eric. Um, so our guest speaker today is Alex Coleman. Alex is the head of Centrica Business Solutions for North America. Centrica is a global energy solutions company. Prior to her role at Centrica, Alex also worked at GE, just like Eric, and she was in the Renewable Energy and Capital Divisions. Alex holds an MBA from Babson College and a bachelor's in civil engineering from Bucknell University. As Eric mentioned, Alex is a founding board member of Engineering Tomorrow and has been a volunteer with the organization since 2015. Alex has played an integral role in the success of Engineering Tomorrow and getting us to where we are today, a lab with over 7,000 students from across the country. Alex is here today to share her journey to a career in the renewable energy sector. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Alex. Thank you, Megan, and hi, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here with you today and um, be, be sharing my story with you. I am just so excited to be here. As Megan mentioned, I've been with the organization for a long time and am just still, every time I get to be with students is my favorite, favorite part of the year. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, just if someone can just give me a thumbs up, maybe Megan, I can see you. So let me know. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to kick it off. Megan did a great job introducing kind of me and Centrica. Uh, so I lead a part of the company here in North America. Um, we are headquartered in the United Kingdom. We provide energy solutions to uh, residential customers in addition to commercial and industrial customers and actually schools like the ones that you're in today. Um, so I will get into all about what Centrica does, but first I will start with me. And I did get a lot of questions in advance um, about kind of asking for advice, how to get into the industry um, and, and what to think about as you're thinking about a career in engineering. So I'll try to hit those as I kind of go through my story. And if anything comes up, please do type in the chat any questions that you may have. I'd be happy to answer them on the fly. Okay, 
So actually, when I was in high school, I was pretty interested in the environment, for sure. I've always had a passion for the environment around us, nature, and just conserving it. I did know kind of early on, maybe elementary school time, right, about recycling and conservation and picking up litter and all of that kind of stuff. And I wanted to find a way where I could spend my life's work working in the environment and, and supporting the environment, protecting it. So originally I thought maybe I should be a marine biologist. And when I was in high school, I had the opportunity to do a little bit of studying of marine biology. And what I learned pretty quickly is that biology is very, very focused on um, a big foundation of biology is memorization. And I am not so good at memorization. <laughs> so I quickly kind of, I was talking to a science teacher of mine. He was my chemistry teacher. He taught uh, AP Chem. And I said, I don't know, what do you think? And he said, well, I really think you should be an engineer. Um, because although you could be an environmental policy and science major, a lot of that is also memorization. You're very good with numbers and with logic, and you like to work with people, and so you may be better off in engineering. So thanks to him, um, I did end up in engineering. Um, one of the questions I got was what classes did I take in high school that helped me be an engineer? Um, so I definitely took AP Chem, AP Physics, Calc. Uh, after the Ray Biology story, you might imagine I didn't take AP Bio, I don't think anyway. Um, but I think, you know, the other question that I got asked is what can you do in high school to prepare for engineering? And my answer is honestly, just stay curious. Do things like this, right? Take advantage of what's in front of you. Take a, take a toy apart and rebuild it again. You know, those are the kinds of things that engineers do. You might think of something to do um, that's just a better way of doing something. And it could be something really simple, like helping around the house with a chore. What's the most efficient way to unload the dishwasher? You know, whatever it is, you know, those are, those are things that are, that's all about like what we do every day as engineers. So I went to Bucknell, as Megan mentioned, um, I got a civil engineering degree. Um, you'll see here it says civil and environmental engineering. So when I was trying to decide what major to be and what school to go to, I was looking for schools that had environmental engineering curriculum. Um, that was not that prevalent at the time. You know, we're talking about, you know, 2000, early 2000s. So environmental studies and was around, environmental engineering was starting to be around. So I chose Bucknell first because I, there was environmental engineering in the name of the major, um, but it was civil and environmental. And the other thing was that it had a real emphasis on the arts. So I could still spend some of my other credits um, really taking taking courses in the arts. I didn't have to be solely engineering focused. And that was really important to me to be surrounded in a collegial environment by people who wanted to be engineers, but also who wanted to be uh, in business and who wanted to be in policy and in the arts so that it was a more diverse place to be um, from a diversity and thought. So um, I also did a couple of internships uh, while I was at Bucknell. My first one was at AIG, a large, large insurance firm. They have an investment group, and I worked in their investment group, um, pre-financial crisis. So it's a little bit of a different place than I'm sure it is today. Um, but, you know, I did have, I've always had, you'll see this in my kind of story, an interest in capital markets and in finance generally because I always had a feeling that, you know, and, and Eric made mention of this as well, that these projects, they require investment, right? And so that's a very important part of the equation. It's an important thing to get to know. But frankly, the reason why I had this internship is because I knew somebody who worked at AIG and they got me the internship. And that's kind of a message that I have for you. Did that internship make me, you know, become a leader of a energy solutions company? 
no, that, that one didn't, right? But it really taught me about what it's like to be in a corporate environment, how to answer the phone. You know what my job was? I, I answered the help desk for the, the tech, the IT department. So every single day, 15 times a day, I said, AIG Global Investment Group Help Desk, this is Alex speaking, how may I help you? And I can still say that to you because <laughs> I said it so many times that summer. And, um, and it's important to kind of get to know what it's like to be in that work environment. And it's also really important to get to know what you don't like to do as you kind of think about those, in, in, those internships and those opportunities to work in the summertime. It's really about just getting out there and learning what you can from what's right in front of you. My second internship between my junior and senior year was with a construction firm. And I did that because you can see civil is a part of my engineering major. When I got to Bucknell, uh, one of the things that I knew was that, uh, I well, what I learned really was that environmental engineering was really all about, and the curriculum at Bucknell at the time, now it's really migrated to something much, much more um, you know, cohesive and, and um, you know, kind of really inclusive of all sorts of topics that we're talking about today. But at the time, it was really all about landfills and wastewater treatment plants. And I just wasn't that interested in landfills and wastewater treatment plants. I was really more interested in wind and solar and efficiency and, and our our environment broadly. And, and, I, and that was a little too narrow for me. So I actually kind of, as I was going through the curriculum at Bucknell, I stuck with civil engineering and decided to go into the construction industry. And here comes my favorite project, which was a question I got. What was my favorite engineering project I ever worked on? So I worked for Kiewit right out of college. It was a construction company. My internship at the construction firm helped me get this job, right? All these things are building blocks into your, into your life and your career. And when I... I joined Kiwit. They put me on the largest bridge project in New York Department of Transportation history at the time, which was a $612 million uh, bridge project. And you're looking at it. What? So what happened, right? So that this is New York City skyline in the background, just rounding out um, up the East River here. And this is one of the movable bridges on the East River. So in a span of about 50 blocks in New York, there are probably, I don't know, five to seven uh, movable bridges. Some of them lift, some of them draw, like a drawbridge. So you all have seen one of those. Um, this one rotates. It rotates on its uh, belly, kind of right here in the middle. And it's called a swing span. So what we had to do was because all these bridges move, by the way, because the on-ramps, um, there's not enough room in Manhattan or the Bronx to have a really big on-ramp, right, for all of these bridges, all of these cross points. So there are some really large bridges, like the Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge, and, and you know, those of you who live in the area can name them. Um, but a lot of them are smaller. And the reason why they are is so that there are buildings and communities and green spaces that are there instead of large on-ramps to the bridges. So my job was to help to build the on-ramps to this bridge. This bridge was not able to be built in New York City because it was too big. There was nowhere to actually, there's no real estate to build it. There were too many buildings, too many you know, streets and whatnot. And so we actually built it in Albany. And then we floated the bridge down the Hudson River from Albany, down the Hudson River, around the tip of Manhattan and up into place. And so as you can imagine, being responsible for, for actually building the part that where the puzzle piece fits in, all of us were sitting there saying, oh, I hope it fits, right? And this was kind of the last biggest puzzle piece to fit in on that bridge project. It was a super exciting, super, super fun project to work on, and I learned a ton there. Um, I'd say that one thing that did come to mind while I was there, which might be in your mind is, well, I thought she said she wanted to be in a career in renewable energy, so why are we talking about bridges? Well, 
I did eventually want to transition back into environmental um, so, you know, kind of more renewable energy focused topics. So I did decide to leave Kiwit and go to get my MBA or go to business school, as a lot of people call it. So it's a master's in business administration. Um, and I went to Babson up in Boston. But the reason I went up to Babson is because they're very well known for entrepreneurship. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to think differently. I wanted to kind of add to that very foundational engineering curriculum that I had, and I wanted to expand my mindset to really think about problems in a very action-oriented way. And so this is really interesting because actually the entrepreneurial process that's taught at Babson is really similar to the engineering process that Eric was referencing earlier. So it's kind of acting and understanding those results from that action, and then acting again, taking in, incorporating what you learn from that action, right? And continuing to iterate on that process to eventually create a product that resonates with the customer base that you're trying to resonate with. And so I had two internships when I was at Babson. This is a two year degree. Um, so I had one during the summer between my first and second year, and I had another one um, that I, I worked for the company while I also went to school um, during my second year. And um, those internships were Fidelity Investments. So you'll see another finance oriented degree. So I still kind of had that inkling in my, in the back of my brain that said, you know, finance is going to be a, an important part of the equation here, right? And also finally having a job in the energy industry. So this is my first job in the energy industry. And I think I was four or five years into my career. So it took me a while to get into the industry, but then finally I was here and I was learning everything I could about the energy industry. Now this was a residential energy efficiency firm. So we were replacing people's windows, we were putting new insulation into their homes, et cetera. And while that wasn't the most exciting part of renewable energy, it wasn't the big wind turbines, et cetera. What it helped me do was it helped me to just understand the language and how people talk about the industry and the kinds of problems that these companies face. Um, so one of the questions I got, by the way, so I'll answer it while we're here, is, um, you know, what is the most challenging interview question I ever got? So at this point, I was interviewing a lot. I did a lot of informational interviews. I was interviewing with a ton of different internship opportunities and finally full-time job opportunities. And I'll tell you that there is no question you can't handle if you are prepared for the interview. So I'd say that while no one question sticks out to being the hardest question I ever answered, I think the hardest question I ever answered was the one I wasn't the, at the interview I just didn't prepare for. I didn't think about why am I here? What do these people need to know about me? What do they need to hear about me? And I think what's really important about the interview process is people, if you go through an interview and you think, gosh, I didn't get a chance to tell them about that really cool engineering tomorrow labs I did, then at the end when they say, do you have any questions for me? You might say, well, hey, there's one thing we didn't talk about about my experience that I think is really important for you to know about me, right? So this is your opportunity to tell these people about you, right? And so make sure when you walk out, but that's what they, they heard that day, was what you wanted them to know, right? Um, okay, so what did I do after Babson? So I had the opportunity, I joined GE, and um, I joined GE through a rotational program. GE is, a lot of large companies have these, where you join a company, and they let you rotate through different roles across the span of two or three years. And so for me, I joined our renewable energy division, which was manufacturing onshore wind turbines at the time. Of course, Eric also showed the pictures of the really large GE offshore turbines, which now exist, which are super cool. Um, and it's really, I mean, like, this is one of the things I want you to know. I don't know anything about, like, I didn't know anything about wind turbines when I got this job. I didn't study a single thing about wind turbines in school. I am an engineering major. I'm not a mechanical or an electrical engineer. I didn't study. Uh, I didn't go to one of these labs. So I never really even understood, you know, how just like I never even played around 
physically with a with a wind turbine, right? Um, but I still there I was, and you know what my job was was to develop the next wind turbine, like the next generation coolest wind turbine you could think of. That was what my job was to work on a team of people to do this, right? And so, you know, the reason why I mention it is just because your career is going to take you in all sorts of you know twists and turns. Um, and just because you start out with one degree or one job doesn't mean you can't find your way into the the part that, the, that you really want to be in. And so one of my first roles at GE was to actually service wind turbines. So I was out in the field because now I'm kind of connecting the dots. I've come from the construction industry. I knew how to build things. I knew how to use cranes. I knew how to be out in the field with crafts men and women. Um, and I just knew, I just knew what it was like to be out there. That was the experience that I brought from the civil engineering world. That was the experience that they needed in the servicing part of wind turbines. And that's how I learned about wind turbines. I actually climbed up to the top of them. I understood about all the ways, everything that is inside that box that makes the, the wind hit those blades, blades turn, then you know we eventually end up generating electricity. All that I learned just from climbing up to the top of these turbines and asking a lot of questions of the people that I was working with. And that's how I learned the industry. And then eventually I had the opportunity to continue to work throughout and you know, end up developing new products. Um, and, and exploring how to expand our product line into Europe. Um, and then eventually I went down to GE Capital. And GE Capital finances the projects that have GE equipment in them. And so I was responsible for deploying $1 billion of investment into GE projects that had GE turbines in them or projects that were of interest to GE to invest in. And there I really learned the relationship between capital or money, right, finances, and the economics of a project and what investors look for as they think about actually putting money into a project. You know, when, when they're putting money into a project, they're looking for their money back over time, right? So they want to, they assess technology a certain way. How will it fail? How will it perform? When will the wind blow? What if it doesn't blow? <laughs> what kind of pricing will I get when I generate those kilowatt hours out of the turbine, right? But all that point of view was really, really important to me as I thought about wanting to be a leader and a business leader in the renewable energy industry. So what if you asked me about my opinion of uh, wind versus solar? <laughs> so I'll tell you uh, that I think there is a need for both. There is no wind versus solar in my world. There is a wind and solar and geothermal and hydro and hydrogen and gas and nuclear, all of these things are a part of our system that's going to help us through the energy transition from traditional fossil fuels to renewable energy in the grid. I did, however, I do have a special place in my heart for solar. And the reason is because solar introduced me in my learning to customers. So what do I mean by that? So I eventually decided to leave GE and join Centrifug. Why did I do that? Well, at GE, they had asked me if I would be interested in not investing in the large wind turbines anymore, but investing in smaller solar projects that were on top of people's roofs. So we call those distributed energy projects. What are distributed energy projects? So you see here the grid. Okay, this is this is really the distribution. This is the utility system that exists that brings power from the wind turbine, right, to your power lines that are, you know, up on telephone poles and whatnot that then bring power into 
the businesses that you shop at, and to your homes. Okay, and that's called the distribution system. And so when you think about the distribution system, when we think about distributed energy, what we're talking about is energy that's produced at the distribution level. So it's not being produced in mass scale at the utility level and then going through the transmission system and down to the distribution system. It is produced at the distribution system. And so when you think about the amount of energy that this building might be buying from the grid, well, the first electron that it consumes is going to be produced by the solar system on the roof, right? Then, then, then once it's pretty, once it's consumed all of the energy that's at the roof, this, that's produced at the roof, then it's going to start to buy electrons from the grid, right? And so what we think about is we think about the distributed generation of this solar facility here. We think about that reducing the need that we need from the grid scale level. And the grid is fed by wind turbines, but it's also fed by combined cycle gas turbines. It's fed by coal. It's fed by all sorts of things. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about the energy transition, right? And maybe as we think about those kilowatt hours that are being reduced because it's first, you know, from the grid, because it's first kilowatt hours actually being generated by the solar system, well, you then add an electric vehicle charging station because maybe this is an Amazon distribution center and they want to electrify the vans that are delivering everything to your house. Or maybe it's a grocery store and a lot of people have switched to electric vehicles and they want to charge their vehicles while they're shopping. Well, every single time somebody charges, that's going to increase the need and the demand of that building, right? So this, these are all the dynamics that we think about as it relates to energy transition. And this is what I got exposed to when my colleagues at GE asked me if I would be interested in working on a project where I would finance, finance solar panels on top of big, you know, places like Home Depot, et cetera. And I said, sure, I'd be interested in that. And once I got to see what those projects were like and just see all of the dynamics around the customer and what that customer needs and what their building usage looks like and how this could change over time and what this means for the grid, it just got me so excited. And I knew that I had to leave GE in order to pursue this interest that I had in distributed energy and in customers and serving customers. And so I found myself at Centrica. So how did I find myself at Centrica? Well, I started to look for a new job. I interviewed with a few people, but ultimately Centrica found me as a lot of times these things happen is a word of mouth, right? Somebody gives you a call and says, um, hey, would you be interested in joining this firm? Now that happens later in your career, right? But it only happens because you had all of those different experiences and you said yes to those experiences that maybe didn't connect the dots, but eventually will connect the dots. So guess what I do at Centrica? I manage the company now in, in North America. But what do we do? We build projects. We build projects that look like this. So that's a lot of construction. And guess where I started? Construction, right? So it all... It all does kind of fit together in the end, but in a way that I never would have anticipated. I didn't say to myself when I was going to have an internship at Conti, the construction firm, when I was at Bucknell, I got to learn about construction because one day I'm going to have, I'm going to be managing a construction company, right? That's not what happens, right? It just so happened that that all was experience I was able to, to pull on to have this career that I've had. So um, this, is a, this is a project, uh, this is actually two projects, uh, but I wanted to see just real life, you know, kind of not, not um, drawings, but real life projects that we built. Um, so this is, this is a large customer um, that has this all roof space, as you might imagine. And um, it's a big, big solar plant on the roof. 
and this is a large battery project. So batteries in the end, neither of these things are nearly as cool looking as wind turbines in my personal opinion, back to the wind versus solar question. But, you know, they are very, very important drivers. And as I think about the energy transition and what Eric was talking about earlier, Eric mentioned that, you know, it's, it's a, it's a transition. There is room for all of these technologies to ultimately deliver electrons to the grid. So that really, what is the goal? Like you want to be able to turn your lights on, right? You want to be able to take a hot shower. Um, you want to be able to get that cold beverage out of the fridge, right? These are the things that, you know, you also want to be able to buy that product, you know, that phone, whatever it is, right? And that all needs to get manufactured by a facility that the facility cannot have a grid outage. It can't, it cannot experience a power outage or else it will lose a lot of product, right? And that will cost money. And that increase in cost, that will be increase in cost to you, right? So this is a big, big cycle of things that all come together. Um, and it all kind of starts with electrons. Right, and, and and distributing them to you, and to these businesses, and to your school right now. So, when will renewables be a primary source? Well, it will depend on the specific grid and how much storage is there to be paired with it, and how much other how much usage can be controlled right to meet the supply of the system. So back to Centrica for a minute. So one of the questions that I was asked was, you know, what are the global challenges that we're facing today and how do they impact uh, companies like the one I work for? So this picture is from a gas storage facility in the United Kingdom. And it is, if you think about it, Gas is now considered kind of a dirty fossil fuel. Generally speaking, that is kind of what a lot of people think about gas these days. But if you, you might've studied in history class one time uh, about the air quality issues in the United Kingdom or in England and how they had a big smog problem from coal. They couldn't see anything. And, like, they couldn't even cross the street, right? They couldn't even know if it was day or nighttime. It was that it was day, that big of a air quality issue. And one of the things they did to respond to that was they transitioned their grid to gas. And they have a big gas distribution system and a big reliance on gas because that was the big innovation at the time to really clean up the air was to use gas. So now we find ourselves in a time where you know, England is very, very reliant on gas on purpose, by the way, that's the way the grid was built. And now they're transitioning to a more electrified grid because what they're trying to do is take advantage of resources like solar and wind power and eventually hydrogen. And so as we think about the transition that we're all experiencing on a global scale from fossil fuels to renewable energy, right? We kind of think about this, I think about this as the energy transition and companies are playing their role today to help customers transition their energy usage while balancing just budgets, right? People need to pay for their energy. And this is kind of what we're talking about on the global level. So let's talk about Russia and Ukraine, right? What happened was there was a big gas shortage as a result of that crisis, right? And what Centrica is doing is storing gas right now at this facility because you know what people need in England if it gets cold? They need heat, right? And they also have to pay the bills. They need to put food on the table, right? And so while there's a desire to pivot to renewable energy and electrifying, that will take time and investment. And in the meantime, people need to stay warm and eat food. Right, quite simply. And so what Quintus is doing is storing gas today while also investing in and researching how we can use this facility in the future to store hydrogen, which is a greener source, 
right? So this is kind of what I mean in this, you know, kind of text here, this global energy company acting responsibly, responding to these really big challenges that we all face as a result of some macroeconomic conditions while trying to build for the, the grid of the future, the sustainable future that we all desire. So you can bring it a bit more kind of local again, if you'd like. So as I think about the landscape and why are we here and why do people care, right? And, and why are you all, this like record number of students interested in this renewable energy lab, Right? And what gets me excited about my career in this space, right? It's, it's you all, and it's me, frankly, right? So what, what is ESG? ESG is environmental social governance. It is a way that the investing community talks about what we all are trying to engineer for, right? It's the way that people say, I want to, in my retirement fund, when I earn that money, when you get your paycheck, some of that's going to go to a retirement fund, hopefully. Right? And we have some extra dollars. You're going to put them in some other investment vehicle. And when that starts to happen, you're going to require that that money is spent responsibly. It's invested responsibly. You don't want that money being used to do something that you don't think is aligned with your interests and goals. And neither do I. Right? And so as more people like you and me join the workforce and demand that they're money is leveraged to be invested in places that are meaningful, that's driving a change. It's driving a change in our world today. And it's starting to get on the ballot. I mean, when I was going to college, and I'm telling you, I was looking for an environmental engineering major. I mean, this wasn't really the topic of conversation as we thought about, you know, what was next on the horizon for candidates. And here we see it at the local level. This year I voted on um, a local environmental challenge that we had in our in our town that was related to wastewater and 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 um and stormwater. And we're voting on it at a national level. We're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, which is an enormous investment and a big amount of money that's going towards this industry that's helping to fuel the transition that we're talking about from fossil fuels to a cleaner grid. So how do I think about this? How does, how does my company think about this as we go and talk to customers on the day to day, right? If we think about one of the schools that I got, that one, of, one of the schools, one of the questions I got from you all was, how can schools and households that wish to use green energy but lack the funds, how can they participate in this transition, right? And the way I think about the transition and, and the way that households and customers like ours, by the way, schools, the ones, the buildings that you're all in, they are a big customer type of mine, right? And what do we do for them, right? So we talk about the way that they use energy today and what the challenges are related to their energy usage. And we develop a roadmap. We say, well, where do you want to get to? Do you want to get to carbon neutrality? Do you want to reduce your um, you know, reliance on fossil fuels? Do you just want to meet your budget? I mean, that's all kind of important as we think about well, what is it that you're trying to achieve at the household level too? What is your goal over the next 10 years, 20 years, maybe not today, right? But what is your goal over the long haul? And then what can we do to help you achieve those goals, right? And the first thing we can do, and Eric said this earlier, is that the greenest electron is the one that's never, ever produced, right? And that has to do with reducing the energy usage that we are um, you know, we're, we're reducing from a baseline and we're saying, okay, can I switch out my light bulbs? Can I, can I change my building envelope to make sure they have no leakage? Can I conserve the water that I use either in my industrial process if I'm manufacturing something or just at home or within the faucets, you know, they automatically turn off. You've seen those. Um, that all is a relation to 
water conservation, which by the way, conserving water also conserves energy because all that water goes to a wastewater treatment plant, which is powered by energy, right? So as we think about that energy reduction, right? Then we can think about, okay, so I've reduced the kilowatt hours that the building's using. Now for the amount that I'm using, how do I make sure they're green, right? And so can I put actually energy generation at my facility, right? Can I put solar on my roof? Can I store some of that solar if there's excess production in the middle of the day um, so that I can make sure that if the power goes out, if the grid is down, that I can still have energy at my facility, right? And to use and run my facility for whatever it is, if I need school to be occurring, et cetera. Um, and so we kind of think about that as it's okay, we planned, we've come up with a plan to reduce your energy usage. Now we're working on converting the energy that you are using, right? And converting it to renewables on site. And then finally, we're looking at filling that energy usage at the end here and, and saying, okay, how do we enhance it? How do we how do we buy green electrons from that large wind, wind plant that we were talking about earlier, et cetera? So that's the way we think about the pathway. And there are funds available to both residential customers, schools like the ones you're in, commercial industrial customers, and all in between that really help customers to balance the plan aspect and their goals versus the budget aspect and, and, and profit that they're trying to achieve. And, and that's that's really the goal is to help customers take advantage of some of the funds that are available at the national and federal level, at the local level, and ultimately get to a project that's going to help them meet their needs. So I always think it's a little helpful as we think about engineering. What are we here to talk about? You know, talk about interest in engineering in my career, um, and and how do you get here? What? Why would you be an engineering major versus anything else? So my job on the day-to-day -day is requires a lot of um, multi interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, whatever you want to say. Uh, it's a lot of different things that I cover every day leading a business. Um, I have to deal with human resources or thinking about our people and ensuring that they're able to bring the best, their best selves to work every day, that they're taking care of um, when something goes wrong and that they you know, get paid every week, that they have the right healthcare benefits for them and their family, et cetera. I have to think about the policies that are in place and that are coming down the pipe as it relates to what's happening in the political climate, right? And how would that impact our industry? I have to look at just the market generally. And the fact you know, that Eric was saying earlier is, you know, there is not enough materials in the world to create enough storage that we need to be fully renewable as a grid. So how do we think about that impacting the price of batteries that we want to put into our projects, right? So that's the external landscape. I have to think about where to place the company, where do we want to go, what customers we want to be delivering to, and what do we want to be delivering to them? What do they need, right? And what's going to help them succeed? We need to think about, well, what's the pricing going to look like? What does the pricing look like out at the grid level? What will our customers be paying, right? As they think about the energy that they're using and that comes to energy trading and, and operations. Of course, product development that dovetails into the strategic aspects I was talking about earlier. A lot of technology and software development as it relates to delivering to our customers what we want to deliver in, from a customer experience perspective, and also just ensuring that as we think about the technologies that we're putting into these facilities, how are they being controlled? How are they being optimized to leverage the building as a potential resource to the grid so that the building can actually use less energy when the grid is constrained, when the grid needs you know, alleviation in a blackout environment? Of course, then we think about sales and marketing. There's a ton of operations involved. There's, of course, customer support when they're either really happy or not happy, and they're given a call and they want to know, you know, how are, how are we operating to fix their challenge? And finally, 
you know, kind of the true for me, it's a profit and loss management, like finance and accounting. I'm responsible for making a profit and turning a profit to Central Coast the parent company in the UK, that's what the North American region that I manage is expected to do. So when you think about this day, you know, I could have had, I think like all of these on the left, they're probably majors that you can major in in college, right? And here I am, you know, the one thing you don't see on there is civil engineering, right? But my civil engineering degree, the way that I was taught to think, the, the engineering and design process, the appreciation for the, the considerations and, and the, the balance between budgets and technical improvements, that's all extremely important foundation for what has been my career. And so I say to you this, I have learned all of these other things on the fly throughout my career, either through a master's in business administration or business school, you know, that two-year um, break I took in my career to really, um, to learn about a different part of the industry, um, or was it, whether it was just on the job, I learned all these things on the fly. The one thing I could not learn on the fly, and that would be very difficult to go back to school for, would be engineering, right? The engineering part is a great, great thing to have as a foundation for your career. And that's what I want you to take away from this today, is that it can bring you in so many different directions. But really what it does is it teaches you how to think, how to work with people, and how to solve challenges. Really, really big, important challenges that are rewarding to work on at the end of the day. I would like to tell you that, you know, I also, I want you to know that I have a family. I have two children um, and a husband and we, um, you know, my kids are young or in the thick of it, I would like to say, um, but we find a way to have balance and have fun. And, and I've had a very, very rewarding career while also building my personal life, which is, which is really important to me. And I think something that you also should know um, because this is your life you're talking about and you're talking about building it. Um, so it is possible to do both of those things. And finally, you know, in a word to engineering tomorrow, you know, somebody, somebody asked a question that I thought was really a really good one, which was how have your professional experiences and working with students helped you, right? So as Megan mentioned, I've been doing things like this since 2015, and a lot of it was in person at first. And at that time, I was still at GE. I didn't have any direct, nobody worked for me. I wasn't anybody's boss. <laughs> I just, you know, kind of worked on my own and, and was building my career a little younger. And what I learned from this, doing this, was how to speak in public and how to do and, and, and how to present in, in a virtual environment to many, many students like you all. And all of that is just, I just got a phone call one day from someone who said, hey, Alex, can you help this, this person out and, and give a presentation on, on wind turbines? <laughs> yeah, sure. Said, okay, show up at this high school and, and present about wind turbines. And, and I did, I said, yes. Yeah. That was one of those just random things, right? And this is kind of back to what I was saying earlier. Uh, what do you do in high school to prepare yourself for engineering? You just say yes. Say yes to things like this. You say yes to you know, what I just said yes to. And now look, right? I'm on the board of this organization. I now lead a company here in North America. And all these things dovetail every day into something really special. But I'm not sure that you can point to one thing to, to say that was it. Except for, I will tell you, but engineering has undoubtedly been a humongous part of my story and in my career. So with that, it's been such a pleasure uh, being with you all. I'd be happy to take any questions um, and I wish you all the best. I want to just hop in and say, amazing, Alex. Yes, you have had an amazing career and path, and I'm glad that it started with engineering to bring you here with us to engineering tomorrow. And I'm glad you got that call back in 2015 to go to a high school and talk about wind turbines. Um, does anybody have any questions? I know that your teachers submitted your questions ahead of time, but are there any questions live for our for Alex right now? Stepanak, 
St. Joseph Regional. Preston, anybody have any questions? I see some, some cameras turning on, some movement, but I'm not sure if anybody has any questions. While we wait for some questions, I'm just gonna paste in chat. Uh, <laughs> something for me is our exit ticket for the students to complete. So we definitely want to hear your feedback for the day today. Um, and I, oh, looks like there was a question earlier from Columbia High School. I'm not sure if you got to see it in the chat, Alex. This one is talking about uh, how much more wear and tear on our roads from electric vehicles because they're much heavier than our regular vehicles. Well, that's a good question. Um, all these things, they, they come with trade-offs, right? That's, I think that's like the major, the major thing to take away, right? Is it's just, it's trade-offs, right? And if you think about the, I, I don't know the answer okay, and how much more wear and tear is going to come from our roads. I am certain that our departments of transportation are actively, actively working on this. What I will tell you, what I do know is all of those folks who work in those agencies are really aware of the desire to kind of move towards this renewable grid, right? And, and so while we think about electrifying vehicles, I think we think about it's gonna be a long transition. You know, we're talking about from here, from now until 2035, you know, beyond, until we get to this place where we know where all, how all these vehicles are powered. Um, and it's something that our roads are maintained. It is an infrastructure requirement, um, but but it is something that is it needs to be balanced. To your point, and then, I think you just answered it in your question. But uh, Academy of Mount Saint Ursula typed a question in chat, and they said, "When will renewable energy be available for the whole world? Will it be in the next few years?" Well, you know, it is available for the whole. Right. And there, there are places where, you know, if you think about like, I saw an article recently, I think it referenced um, a, a large hydroelectric plant, you know, that has water dammed up, right? And then you release the water and it generates electricity, you know, the old, tales old as time kind of thing, right? And now it's being called the largest water battery in the world. But it's not anything different from hydroelectric generation, right? And the fact that it's been there. I do think that most, you know, it is absolutely becoming very cost effective, right, to bring renewables to many places across the world. Um, and it is something that a lot of nations are very focused on. And there is a you know an effort at the global level to distribute some of the wealth and technical knowledge um, from some of the nations that have been really big climate contributors um, to some of the nations that are maybe experiencing climate change and haven't had the investment in their in their infrastructure to take advantage of some of the technological advances that have occurred. But as the technologies get more and more deployed, as costs come down, um, that is something that you know we I, I anticipate being accessible to everybody. The question might have also been, when will everything be powered by renewables forever? And that question, I think, is probably never the answer to that question, because I think there will always be a need for a balanced grid, and there will always be a need for resilience and, um, and, and for us to have kind of a mix of fuels, if you will. That's my personal opinion. <laughs> Well, I want to say thank you to Alex. I don't think there are any other questions. We have about 10 minutes left, but I think we're going to wrap up early. It's been a long day. These students have made amazing projects, Alex. I know you got to say, sit in for the wrap up and see some of their designs, which were, were amazing. They were awesome. I yes. love them. So love I them. want to, I know we gave a big uh, kudos to Eric for leading, but I want to give a round of applause to you for leading our keynote. But I want to give a really big round of applause to our teachers and students who participated today, who did an amazing job at engagement. They were all prepared and ready to go and been here with us all day. So I want to say thank you. Don't forget to complete your exit tickets. Teachers, you have an exit ticket. And students, you have an exit ticket. Can't wait to, to, to hear from you all about today. We do have our next special event on February 2nd for drug delivery. The flyer, it has been in the chat. You have been, you will be getting that email uh, as well. And I want to say thank you again to the ET team for making this happen. I know Eric is still on the line. Thank you, Eric. Thank you all. Have a great day and we will see you for the next one.
Bye, everybody.